Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, broadcasting from an overcast, uh, partly sunny sky in Chesapeake, Virginia. <laughs> it's 10 a.m. in the morning here where we are, although our broadcast is scheduled for 9 central. And today we are, good morning, Cynthia, Robert, Batista, God bless you. Today we are continuing in the genealogies. And uh, uh, I feel like I, I needed to uh, get my tongue untwisted real good yesterday so that we could continue on today uh, in First Chronicles chapter 2. I'm going to have mercy on Kitty. Yay. And uh, let her just uh, uh, let me do the. Re I actually enjoy reading these uh, names and things that you can't hardly pronounce in the Bible. Uh, I've, I'm kind of jealous whenever she gets to do them. So now <laughs> I get to do them for the next many uh, chapters. Today in First Chronicle chapter two, and if I remember correctly, chapter three tomorrow is narrowing down on uh, David's specific bloodline. Uh, this chapter, the genealogies continue to re referencing Jacob through Heman, the father of the Rechabites. The Rechabites are interesting. I hope I have time as we get to the bottom of the, the hour or bottom of the, the Bible study to talk a little bit about the Rechabites. There are several ignominies that are cited in this chapter, such as Achan, who died in the Valley of Achor as the troubler of Israel, and also Ur, the firstborn of Judah, who refused to perform the right of kinsman redeemer in behalf of Tamar, his sister-in-law. Another thing you're going to see today is several daughters and mothers are mentioned in this chapter, which is unique in ancient uh, writings to see women uh, upheld and so uh, in so distinguished a manner, which was just not common in ancient times. More in those days, women were just chattel uh, and uh, were not uh, upheld highly unless they were of royal blood, but in the writings and the narrative of the scripture, they are. Uh, upheld and uh, and it just shows the distinctness of the scripture. We have 55 verses in our chapter today and we'll begin and I don't know if you've noticed but pretty much when we do these chapters uh, I always divide them into three parts uh, unless the text or the content dictates that I should uh, do it differently. But here we go. Verse 1. First Chronicles, chapter 2. These are the sons of Israel, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Notice that Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, that Reuben, Simeon, and Levi did not have the birthright. It was given to Judah. Reuben slept with his father's concubine. Simeon and Levi brought scandal upon the family when they... Um, uh, were, were cruel showed, and broke a covenant with a city that uh, they had come into a trade agreement with. And so they were excluded. And now Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, Dan. Dan is not included in the genealogies in the book of Revelation, in the foundations, the 12 foundations of the heavenly city in the 144,000. 12 tribes are mentioned, but it's the half tribes of uh, um Naphtali and I believe Ephraim were the half tribes to make 12 in the mentions of the tribes in Revelation. Interesting that Dan's left out when he's the lawgiver. The lawgiver's left out. Joseph and Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And now we talk about the sons of Judah. Judah, Ur, and Onan, and Shelah, which three were born to him of the daughter of Shua, the Canaanitess, and Ur, the firstborn of Judah, was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Tamar, his daughter-in-law, bare him Pharaoh's and Zerah. Now it's interesting, what did Ur 
Judah's, it's like he was trying to think, here's my joke for the day. He was trying, they asked him, what are you going to name this baby? He said, er, uh, <laughs> and they wrote it down, er, mm. and I'm, it's my <laughs> joke. But you think about it, he, Tamar, the, I think it was uh, Sheila, the younger brother had died. It was Ur's job uh, that no children had been born to, to she, Sheila and Tamar. And so it was Ur's responsibility to impregnate Tamar so that she could raise up children, not to Ur, but to the memory of her husband, Sheila, which was Ur's younger brother. Ur refused to do that. And he it said he died before the Lord. And you think about that because of selfishness, ego. He didn't want to raise up children to his brother. Do you realize that he was on in line to be a part of the paternity and the heritage of Jesus himself? And because he chose to be selfish, how many times with brothers and sisters do you see that kind of selfishness? Maybe you and I, maybe you've done that yourself at times. Or you've had siblings that have been uh, selfish and mean-spirited. And what a tremendous cost Ur paid, not just forfeiting his life. He forfeited one of the most important destinies you could have as a human being simply because he didn't want to raise up children to the memory of his brother. Boy, what a terrible thing. Uh, uh, and what a high price to pay for sibling rivalry, which so contaminates families today. And unfortunately, Christian families are not exempt. And so Ur was evil. Uh, the firstborn of Judah was evil in the sight of the Lord. And he slew him. And Tamar, the daughter-in-law, bare him Perez and Sarah, which is interesting because she pretended to be a harlot. And Judah went into her. So he's consorting with prostitutes and impregnates her and then finds out his daughter-in-law Tamar is pregnant and he's going to have her burned alive but he for being a prostitute but yet he was going to prostitutes himself and then she proved what she had done and he repented uh, good for him uh, and Tamar his daughter-in-law bare him Perez and Zerah and all the sons of Judah were five the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul the sons of Zerah Zimri and Ethan and Heman and Calcol and Dara, five of them in all, and the sons of Carmi, Achar or Achan, the troubler of Israel who transgressed in the thing accursed. And the sons of Ethan were Azariah, the sons also of Hezron, that bore unto him Jeremiel and Ram and Chelubai, and Ram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nashon, prince of the children of Judah, and Nashon begat Salma, and Salma begat Boaz. Hello, he's the one that married Ruth. And Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat his firstborn Eliab, and Abinadab the second, and Shema the third, and Nethaniel the fourth, Redei the fifth, Ozem the sixth, David the seventh. Oh, look at that, the seventh son. Isn't that interesting? Whose sisters were Zeruiah and Abigail, and the sons of Zeruiah, Abishai, and Joab, and Asael, three. And Abigail bare Amasa, and the father of Amasa was Jether, the Ishmaelite. And Caleb, the son of Hezron, so here's another Caleb, begat children of Azubah, his wife, and Jerioth, her sons are these, Jeshur, Shobab, and Arden. And Azubah was dead. Caleb took unto him Ephrath, so he performed the right of kinsman redeemer, and which bare him her. Now, in many of the prophetic scriptures, Isaac's son, notice it starts out referring to uh, Jacob as Israel. In many of the prophetic scriptures, Isaac's son is referred to as Jacob and not Israel. Here, now think about Ezra writing this in the post-exilic period. They're in exile. Here, in the stinging aftermath of the exile and the complete rout and captivity of the southern kingdom of Judah, the name given Jacob after he wrestled with the Lord is used. He called him Israel. So what's in a name? Jacob means heel grabber and supplanter, which in fact is indicative of the character of the man who goaded his elder brother Esau into relinquishing his birthright. When Jacob wrestled with the Lord, the angel touched him in the hollow of his thigh, forever altering his walk. 
and consequently renaming him Israel, which means one who has wrestled with God and prevailed. When one wrestles with God, we don't change God, but rather God changes us. Judah's firstborn is also mentioned in a negative light, talking about Ur. What was his name? Ur, or, right. Mm -hmm. uh, he was expected to go into his widowed sister-in-law, Tamar, bring up children after his deceased brother, but he declined to do so and subsequently died before his time. His selfish act is so despicable it earns a mention by Ezra centuries later as a cautionary reference for those who put personal ego, sibling rivalry, and pride above responsibility and brotherly love. Achan is also mentioned who sinned after the manner of Judah's firstborn in corrupting himself and the nation by disobeying God at the Battle of Jericho. Ur er sinned in uh, failing to display brotherly compassion. Achan sinned in shirking his uh, community, responsibility to the community of the entire nation. Uh, the city had fallen and God had commanded that the entire city be destroyed and nothing be saved because it was the first fruits of the conquest of the promised land and therefore it belonged to God. Jericho was not ordered to be destroyed totally because it was particularly evil, although it was particularly evil. It was t said, commanded by God for it to be destroyed because it was the first fruits, the first city to fall in the promised land. So it's the principle of first fruits. You know, the Bible says, uh, it, it speaks of the tithe in the Old Testament. It calls it, it is the devoted thing. And if you look that word devoted up, it means the accursed thing. Achan, remember what the verse we just read said, Achan transgressed in the accursed thing. Well, that same word is used to describe the tithe as the devoted thing. It's devoted to God. The first fruits is devoted to God. And if we keep it for ourselves, the devoted thing becomes the accursed thing. And so for us, it's an analogy of withholding the first fruits of our own increase. Now, I get, uh, I would never take the tithe away from anybody, but you know, the old covenant emphasizes the tenth. And when Jesus talked about money, he said, give it all, give it all, give everything, go sell all, come follow me. Is that even workable in uh, uh, everyday life? Well, Kitty and I have found that when you give everything up for God, he gives it all back with a bigger bucket. Mm -hmm. And so you survive, you cannot survive giving everything up unless God responds in kind. But it takes a level of faith to do that. Because when you give everything up, uh, there is a seed time and harvest process by which God, at the time you're giving it up, God has um, something bigger and better coming your way, but it does require trust. It does require faith. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, if the tithe, you know, the, the scripture says, um, uh, turn to me and I will turn to you. If you show yourself froward or perverse with me, I'll show myself perverse with you. That's what Zechariah the prophet said in the book of Zechariah. And so God's response is measured many times according to the quality and the quantitative aspect of how we respond to him. And I don't want 10% of anything God has for me. I want everything that God has for me. And so uh, thinking in terms of those boundaries of 10%, sometimes if we're not careful, we get legalistic. I think we exclude ourselves from what God had, has for us. Achan hid a wedge of gold in a garment from Babylon in his tent. And as a result, the people could not stand against their enemies. And 38 people died the next day after going up against a very small village. The Lord had indicated there was sin in the camp and Achan was exposed. And it's one of the most poignant scriptures in the Bible that they went out to the Valley of Achor, which the, says the Valley of Achor is a door of hope. And Joshua says to Achan, it's revealed by casting of lots, the Urim and the Thummim, that Achan is the one they needed to deal with. And Joshua says to, to Achan very tenderly, he says, give glory to God's son and do not hide from me the thing that you have done. What a moving and tender and touching 
thing in light of the fact that after that, Achan and his entire family and all of his possessions were stoned to death and buried at the valley of Achor, which again is later termed by the prophets as a door of hope. Why would the valley, the only thing that ever happened in Achor was Achan and his family were stoned to death there. Why would it be called a door of hope? Why not be a door of judgment? Uh, because the path of progress for any of us when we are defeated by our enemies, see, they were defeated. They conquered Jericho supernaturally and then got defeated and had casualties and couldn't take a little bitty village. So they asked the question. And the door of hope was in realizing they had not given to God wholly the first fruits. The door of hope is have you rendered to God the first fruits? See, if you haven't rendered to God the first fruits, then we exempt ourselves from the teaching Jesus gave in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom and all things will be added. They had enough sense when they conquered a mighty city and then got uh, defeated over a small village. They got enough sense to ask the question. And the question was that they had transgressed in the accursed thing. And remember the word accursed there is the same as the word devoted. In other words, you've kept something for yourself that you should have given to God. And so when you are defeated in an area, maybe you're being assaulted in the area of finances or in some other area of your life, ask yourself, are you transgressing in the devoted thing? Are you transgressing in the thing that belongs to God? And of course, we know that we are bought with the price and everything we have and everything we are belongs to God. And so have we transgressed in the devoted thing and in so doing, cause ourselves unnecessary pain and suffering. It's worth answering that question. Things are the way they are because of what we're doing. If you want something different, you have to do something different. Verse 20, and her begat Uri, and Uri begat Bezalel. You should recognize that name. And afterward, Hezron went in to the daughter of Maker, the father of Gilead, whom he married when he was three score years of age, made a note of him. He was 60 years of age and he's having kids. <laughs> and she bare him Segub. And Segub begat Jair, and, who had three and 20 cities in the land of Gilead. And he took Jeshur and Aram, the towns of Jair, and from them, and Kenath and the towns thereof, even three score cities. All these belonged to the sons of Maker, the father of Gilead. And after that, Hezron was dead in Kela Beth Rata. Caleb Beth Rata. And then Abiah, Hezron's wife, bare him Asher, the father of Tekoa. And the sons of Jeremiel, the firstborn of Hezron, were Ram, the firstborn, and Buna, and Oren, and Ozem, and Ahijah, and Jeremiel had also another wife whose name was Atara. She was the mother of Onam. And the sons of Ram, the firstborn of Jeremiel, were Maaz and Jamin and Eker. And the sons of Onam were Shemei and Jada. And the sons of Shemei, Nadab and Abishur. And the wife of Abishur was Abihail, and she bare Aben and Molid. The sons of Nadab were Selid, and Apaim, and Selad died without children. And the sons of Apaim, Ishi, and the sons of Ishi, Shishan, and the sons of Shishan, Eli, and the sons of Jada, the brother of Shemei, Jether, and Jonathan, and Jether died without children. And the sons of Jonathan were Peleth and Zaza. These were the sons of Jeremiel. Now Shishan had no sons but daughters. And Shishan had a servant, an Egyptian, whose name was Jara. And Shishan gave his daughter Jara, his servant, to wife. And she bare him Atai. And Atai begat Nathan. And Nathan begat Zabad. And Zabad begat Ethlal. And Ethlal begat Obed. And Obed begat Yehu. And Yehu begat Azariah. <laughs> so the line of Caleb is paid special attention to, and Caleb's grandson, Bezalel, was particularly mentioned. Bezalel was the artisan who constructed and fabricated from resources and materials on hand in the wilderness, the Ark of the Covenant and the Tent of the Tabernacle, according to the pattern revealed to Moses in the Mount. Several of those mentioned in the passage above 
were distinguished for what we would call today the ministry of helps. Caleb and Hur and others who held Moses' arms up defeated cities that other tribes couldn't defeat. These were the names of distinction passed on to those in later generations. They were not articulate men or people of literary distinction. Nevertheless, they were well known for their giftings, their sacrifice, and their heart for the things of God and willingness to shoulder the responsibility to see the plans of God put forward as best they could. Particular attention is paid to daughters and mothers in the genealogies that Ezra reproduces here, which is unusual in ancient times. In verse 34, Shishan had no sons, but his daughters were women of distinction and worthy of mention in the chronicles of the families of Judah. This is what makes the Bible unique throughout ancient history in that it acknowledges and recognizes with honor and deference the role of women in the sacred narrative more than any other religion extant at the time. Verse 39, And Azariah begat Helez, and Helez begat Elisa, and Elisa begat Sisamai, and Sisamai begat Shalom, and Shalom begat Jechamiah, and Jechamiah begat Elishama. Now the sons of Caleb, the brother of Jeremiel, were Misha, his firstborn, which was the father of Ziph, and the sons of Merasha, the father of Hebron, and the sons of Hebron, Korah, Tapua, and Recham, and Shema. And Shema begat Raham, the father of Jorkoam, and Recham begat Shemei, and the son of Shemei was Maon, and Maon was the father of Beth Zur. And Ephah, Caleb's concubine, bare Haran and Moza and Gazez, and Haran begat Gazez, and the sons of Jaadai, Regum, and Jotham, and Jeshan, and Pelet, and Ephah, and Sheath, and Maaka, Caleb's concubine, bare Sheber and Terhana. She also bare Sheath, the father of Madmana. Shiva, the father of Machbena, and the father of Gibeah, and the daughter of Caleb was Aksa. These were the sons of Caleb, the son of Hur, the firstborn of Ephrata, Shobal, the father of Kir, Jath, Jerim, Salma, the father of Bethlehem, Hareth, the father of Beth Gader, and Shobal, the father of Kir, Jath, Jerim, had sons, Haroa, and half of the Manathites, and the families of Kirjath Jerim, the Ithrites, and the Puites, and the Shumites, Shumathites, and the Mishrates. Of them came Zarathites, and the Eshtalites, the sons of Salma, Bethlehem, and the Netophathites, Ataroth, the house of Joab, and half the Manathites, and the Zorites. The families of the scribes which dwelt in Jabez, the Terathites, the Shimeathites, the Succothites, these are the Kenites that came out of Hemath, the father of the house of Rechab. So Caleb, of course, was a great grandson, the original Caleb, and his name shows up again in the line of that Ezra site. The line of Abraham continuing in Jacob down to Judah and now honoring the line of Caleb. We remember the prophecy repeated throughout scripture that Judah goes first and is mentioned therefore first in the genealogies of the tribes of Israel. Caleb's daughter Aksa is a distant relative of another Caleb, the son of Hezron, but she is an immediate descendant of the Caleb who spied with Joshua in the beginning of the conquest of Canaan. She's remembered for being the wife of the first of the judges of Israel by the name of Othniel. Those of you that were with us when we studied Judges will remember that. After he won her to his bride by defeating Deber. There is also mention of the Kenites, who were originally aliens, not of Hebrew lineage, but in time became incorporated into the line of Judah. And so we read and study these genealogies to be thorough in our study of the scriptures. It may seem tedious, as Paul said in Philippians 3.1, to write the same things to me is grievous, but for you it is safe. The book of Chronicles is a book of repetitions, as are the Gospels, particularly the first three Gospels, considered the syncretic Gospels. 
We might wish to circumvent them for more meaningful texts, yet there are things here that we won't find anywhere else if we take the time to discern and to recognize them. So there you have it. I'm going to go put my tongue on ice now. <laughs> uh, like I said yesterday, now I've said my ABCs. Tell me that you're proud of me. Uh, quite honestly, I rejoice to study these things, even the things that seem inconsequential to those of us that live in a 24-hour news cycle that have to be entertained above all else. But I find them interesting, and they contain interesting information. So God bless you. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll be back tomorrow in the continuation of the genealogies of First Chronicles.